It's my pleasure to introduce Peter Leiden. Uh, Peter lives in the Bay Area. He's married with a grown daughter, and I just understand she's taken a year to travel the world. Isn't she lucky? Uh, Peter started his career as a journalist, including uh, serving as a special correspondent for Newsweek magazine in Asia. Uh, Peter frequently gives keynote talks, like today, on new technologies and trends shaping the future. He's a co-author of two books, The Long Boom and What's Next, and those are available on Amazon, I just checked. Uh, Peter was managing editor at the original Wired magazine, and I know a lot of you know him from there, uh, that introduced the world to the di digital revolution. Uh, he was founding director of the New uh, Poli Politics Institute that helped those in Washington transition their politics to the internet. He worked at Global Business Network, the pioneering think tank, helping corporations plan for the future. Uh, Peter recently founded and is CEO of Reinventors, a startup company based in a mission here in San Francisco that gathers top innovators in video roundtables to help solve complex challenges and reinvent our world. Peter's topic today is entitled Ground Zero for the Reinvention of America. Uh, Peter, again, will take questions at the end of the presentation. Please welcome Peter Leiden. Peter. Wow. Thank you for that warm introduction. And uh, thanks to the Commonwealth Club. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, and thanks to all the friendly faces I can see out here uh, of people I've worked with and known over the years. I do get a chance, uh, luckily, to uh, do a lot of speaking. Uh, around the country, occasionally outside the world. I rarely actually get a chance to do it here, funny enough. And so when I got this opportunity, I thought, you know, there's been a talk I've been wanting to work out for a long time here about San Francisco and the Bay Area. When I say San Francisco, by the world, way, I'm always talking about the larger Bay Area. I've always wanted to do a talk on where San Francisco is going in the next 10, 20, 30 years, and this is a great opportunity to do that. And so hear me out. The way to kind of think about this is I'm going to basically jump right into it and cut to the chase and say, I think San Francisco, we are living through really the story of our lives. I mean, we are living for a story for the ages, you could say. And in fact, ultimately, I think this is a, a time that is going to be remembered for a long, long time. I think it's really, we kind of are privileged to be at the epicenter of what I think is really going to be seen at, over time as a reinvention, a fundamental reinvention of what America is and how it does. It's going to be seen as building the systems of the 21st century that are going to be up to the challenge of climate change. And ultimately, I think with time, and this is the bigger swing, that I think we're going to see these as the early days of essentially the building of a new kind of civilization, a 21st century civilization. I think people in 10, or, you know, maybe 50, 100, I think 500 years from now, are going to look back on this early 21st century and they're going to say, huh, that's when the world went digital, that's when the world went global, that's when the world went sustainable, and man, so much of that happened in San Francisco here. So, I'm going to spend the next hour here, or close to it, trying to make the case of this and get you to think it out, and I'd love to kind of hear your feedback at the end here. Now, the first thing to kind of do to get this going is we have to set aside the smartphones, no more tweet time, no more, you know, you can't be thinking on, oh my God, what's going to get me to the weekend or what's going to happen as a business for the next, you know, quarter or we even got to think occasionally as a country, we think even four years. We got to be thinking up about it and the waves of national history or ultimately world history. And because it's when you think back the way I just kind of framed it, when people look back on this era, you'll really see what are the fundamental things happening and all the little craziness of the day to day kind of falls by its side. And when you take that perspective, you really have to see that we are going through some pretty extraordinary transformation in the world right now. And I think there's, it's on, we've seen these kind of transformations occasionally throughout American history and occasionally in world history. And what, is, and what they do is they essentially prompt a breakdown of the existing systems around them, and essentially they force a kind of a reinvention over the next 10, 20, 30 years of a kind of new systems across government, across the economy, across all kinds of ways of living. Now, these periods, and there's been about four of them in American history, are usually prefaced by these deep structural changes to like the fabric of the economy. Like you go from an, 
agrarian to an industrial economy. Those kind of levels are go from rural to urban living. And so we're talking big structural changes happen. The old way of doing things just break down, and you have to reinvent new ways of doing things. The other thing that actually prompts them is there's some unprecedented challenge that you just the old system can't deal with, like the advent of nuclear war, that kind of thing. And so if you think like that, there's been four different times in American history where this has happened. And I would argue we're in the fifth one now. We ha it happened in the very early part of the, 20th, uh, the 19th century with the election of Thomas Jefferson. There was a kind of a reworking of America that essentially set up systems of much more democratized economy and democracy that lasted for about 50 years. Then we saw one around the Civil War, where it wasn't just about ending slavery. There was all kinds of things about Homestead Act and democratizing uh, land-grant universities and connecting up the west of the, the great transcontinental railroads, those kind of things. Then we set up a system that lasted for about 50 years. We saw one around the early 20th century where industrial capitalism was coming into big cities. We saw some real fundamental changes there around the progressive era, lasted about explosion of change about 15 to 20 years there. And the last time we saw it here in this country was coming off the Great Depression, World War II, and essentially the creation of that post-war society is what we're still hanging on to today. I'm going to make the call here, and I know there's been a, people kind of over the last eight years have been thinking about, you know, where, what, where is Obama think? I think actually with time, Obama's going to be seen as literally an historic president. And he's going to be seen as someone who is really going to go down the same kind of ways that these were flashpoints of where we started to turn the whole system of how our government works, how our economy works, and ultimately moves towards the great challenge of our era, which is going to be climate change. And I think right now we kind of get all worried about little things about him, and everyone gets, has their own little issues with it. I think when you really strip it all away, he's playing long ball politics, and I'm going to get back to that in a little bit here, explain that why. So if you think about our era, and you think, huh, okay, well, what are those deep structural changes? Well, look what's happening. We are going through the most fundamental technological change that really, in American history, in the short amount of time here. The digitization of everything, making everything go digital and connecting all these up through the computer internet. I mean, we talk about this all the time, like it's a big deal. But this is a world historical movement. It is essentially changing the way we can do everything. This will be seen, like I say, in 500 years' time. It will think, ah, digital, that's when they went digital, finally. The second thing that's totally unprecedented is we are essentially now organizing everything on a planetary scale. It's, we're still relatively in the early days of this, but it's just getting increasingly integrated. And again, that breaks open all the old ways of doing things in such a fundamental way that you really have to fundamentally rethink everything. And ultimately, we have the challenge of all challenges, climate change. And this is such a mind-boggling challenge that essentially it is going to require rethinking everything. And again, we know that at just on the surface, but when you think that through, it, has to, it calls for the kind of changes that are almost at a civilizational scale. So if you think about, you know, climate change, global warming, all these crises is happening here, you know, water shortages, oh my God, do we got that on the horizon here? You know, mass migrations around that. We're going to be seeing terrorism we're still struggling with. We basically got nuclear proliferation, which we're still struggling with. I'm doing that on my company time here. Pandemics, all the other things. There's all these issues and the breakdown of the old systems of like health care, education, and retirement. This is a sign of that we are watching one of these junctures of history where it's going to prompt some real fundamental reinvention. So whether you like it or not, we're in the game here, and uh, that is where we're going to go next. Now, this is where it starts getting really trippy, and I usually don't talk about this to normal business audiences, but I think you can actually start thinking about this as a civilizational scale change. And I think if you really take a long lens in history, if you go back millennia, there's been a few times where we fundamentally changed how we organize everything. The Greek city-states, you know, the Roman Empire, you know, feudal monarchies, the Enlightenment democracies, and I'm going to return to that later. I think that's what we're entering, that level of change. And that's where I think you've got to start thinking. Now, we're only going to think about that a little bit at the end here. So if you're thinking, huh, where in the world would you actually start thinking that solving that level of problem, that kind of system rethink, where would you go? And you're looking over the world, you're thinking, huh, would it be in China? They're doing a lot over there. No, would they go to Japan? Where would you go? <laughs> you know, exactly. Well, you say, well, it's going to be America. So you say, okay, well, we want to get, we should get to America. And if you go to America, you think, well, where in America? You're going to go to New York? You're going to go to kind of, no, Chicago? No, you're going to go to California. And if you go to California, you're going to go, huh, you're going to go, you're going to go in Southern California? You think this, are you going to go to Northern California? You're going to go to Northern California, right? And, uh, and if you keep focusing in, uh, now, I do think the Bay Area should be considered as a whole, but I think you've got to even think San Francisco here, and ultimately you're going to go further. I, this is my little place in the mission here. I would even go, the mission is ground zero right now. 
But anyhow, the point is, this is the place in the world. And the why is this? Well, it's an ex- all the seeds of the future are here. I mean, really, there's no other place on the planet that's going on here. The explosion of entrepreneurship, social and technological. There's the infusion of venture capital and this crazy explosion of, of uh, startups going on here. It's also, but it's not just technology. It's like we've got this global melting pot here. At a time when the U.S. and China have to essentially broker the future around climate change, We've got, you know, a third of the city is Chinese, our mayor is Chinese, I mean, Chinese descent. I mean, it's like, this is a place that's melding pot for the world right now. We're also melding the cultures. You're seeing it all in the kind of Marin County spirituality. At Ber- I come from Berkeley. I mean, anyhow, you're watching the melding going on there. You're watching solar energy explosion around how we work that. We're watching electric transportation. We've got Tesla here that's really pushing the bar. But we also got genetics, genetic engineering. Genetic understanding. We've got biotech. Biotech is about where the infotech industries were about 20 years ago, just poised for huge growth. We've got robotics are now taking off. We've got artificial intelligence. We're going to have to figure out what are, what are your machines going to do ultimately and what are humans going to do. We've got nanotechnology building at the atomic scale, which promises very little waste in terms of building things. We, but it's, and we've got space technology now it's starting to go up. With, here we've got Elon sitting in his cockpit there. But it's not just technology. We've got, we're kind of started the revolution in gay marriage. We've basically got the sharing economy going on here. We've got the food revolution going on. I'm sitting in Berkeley there with Michael Palm and Jay Penny and the whole thing. We've got, you know, Oakland farms in the cities here. And we've got the uncategorizable Burning Man. I don't know where you put that. (laughs) But the point is, which is where San Francisco goes to vacation, summer vacation. But anyhow, in general, we have essentially got the place, this is a, you know, sustainability too, and, and again, landscaping, all kinds of things about buildings and efficiencies here. So the long and the short of it is like, there's all this evidence around us. And so I want to basically make this case more systematically to you in six different ways. We're going to move really fast through this. One is I'm going to say at the core of technology, there is a lot of room going on here with the technology running um, boom here that's got to go here. We'll talk a little bit about that. Second is the economics of this thing. We are, I think, we are just, what we, the place is on fire right now, the economy. It is just going to continue for a long time here, I'm going to argue. We'll talk about that later. I think we're watching a demographic shift that w- bodes extremely well for this transformation. The next generation is going to do this. It ain't going to be the boomers who are fading out. I think with California here, um, we're the future. I think we've now got a clear running field ahead of us here, even at the statewide level, to really do some massive things that just can't be done at a uh, national level. And I think ultimately there's this civilization piece I want to make a few reflections on, and I sense bring it back to reinventions. A lot of turf to go here, but I'm going to flick it through fast, and I think it'll make it fun here for most people. Now, I am a true believer. I want to say this to start out. I came, I came here at the very early Wired magazine because it was the place where the revolution was happening, right? And it's been 20 years. We just had our 20-year anniversary uh, about a year ago. Uh, and so I've been watching this for 20 years here. And one thing I think with time, as I've really thought about this, done a lot of speaking on this, there's this key thing that everyone kind of or many people know in the Bay Area here, but you've got to really grok the power of this thing which is this idea of that we are getting twice as powerful ch- computer chips every couple of years here, and we're getting the price of these things are dropping dramatically. It's the Moore's Law phenomenon. People have probably heard this, but what people don't really grok is that when you start doubling things, which we did in the early days here in the Bay Area, it's okay, it's doubling. Technically, that is doubling. But as you get later in these cycles, the power boosts get so immense that essentially you're through the roof, and then you're two floors up, and then you're four floors up. We're 35, 40 years into this thing, we are getting this extraordinary transformations going on with, this, with the computers now. We've got now essentially in 30 years, we've gone essentially, the short answer to think about this is we went, computers got 10,000 times more powerful or 10,000 times cheaper basically in 30 years. The f- clock speed, the speed of these computers, thir- that in the 70s, a supercomputer would have about a clock speed of about 150 megaflops, which is right, right there cost 31 million bucks. The iPad 2 beat it, actually, and that chip then went into the iPhone 4, which is it for 200 bucks, and ultimately now those are absolutely about three generations. So it's like crazy craziness going on there. The reason I'm saying this is like think out the next 10, 15 more years of this, and you start getting extraordinary power. The second thing that we're finally hitting the crest of here is the interconnection of everything going on here on the planet. And this is, again, bears remembering, because we're sitting at the epicenter of this, 
2000, this is essentially what was going on with how many people were on the internet as a percentage of different regions of the world. In North America, we only still had 31% of the population on, on the internet 2000, 15 years ago. At 10, 2010, those numbers jump up, but, and so the Middle East was at 30%. We saw the craziness breaking out there. But we have an extraordinary lot of running room here in front of us here. So we've got about over, a little over a third of the planet on the internet now. 75% of the planet is on cell phones. And we know for sure in the next 10 years that'll connect up essentially everyone. And on the backs of those phones, you're going to watch the internet come right over it in the simplest way, email. And then on the backs of that, you're going to see another generation of uh, 4G generation that essentially will be able to move video and do all the big things here. So in, it's inevitable in, within the next 10 years here, the entire planet will be totally connected up in the way we always dreamed about uh, 30 years ago. So the way to keep thinking about this in the tech world is there's this old adoption curve kind of thing that actually is useful to this day of how technologies start out. They start out with these, little, these innovators, they get the early adopters who start playing with them, you watch the early majority go into it, late majority comes around, ultimate laggards go. All technologies follow this, but also social movements work like this too. And then you get this kind of tipping point. Once it hits a critical mass, things start to flip really fast. The other way in technology circles we talk about this is paradigm shifts. You have an old way of doing something, and then there's a new way of doing something, that just says, huh, that might be a different way. And you get enough people to show that that is a superior way to go, and then there's this like, boom, boom, paradigm shift. It happens overnight. Uh, and you see this again, technologies, but you also see it in politics. Look what happened with gay marriage. Same thing, like, it just goes like this. We're on the verge of many of these around climate change, is what I'm saying. So if you look in the last 20 years here at Wired, my Wired years here, the 90s was one boom, one of these kind of adoption curves of getting the early internet on. The second boom we just lived through in the 2000s there, which is essentially the high bandwidth boom, which sucked all other media onto it. And the interesting thing here is when we started the internet, the early days of the internet in 90, there was only 6% of the world's data was digital. Now it's 100%. And the reason this is getting interesting is this is what people talk about big data. We have gone, listen to this number, this is quite extraordinary. Since the time we've been banging on stone tablets, starting to record information, to 2003, all human beings put together the equivalent of essentially five exabytes of data. Just take that as a, for those who know exabytes, it's a big number, but it's not that big. We are now producing five exabytes of data every two days, every two days. And now the world's information is doubling essentially every two years, just on the Moore's Law thing. This is why everything is now digital. Everything can be searched, everything can be analyzed. Huge implications on this. Now, the one thing I want to point out, which has in, it, implications for innovation and s solving problems, is this thing with video, which is totally underappreciated, in my opinion. Uh, but it's going to be understood here a lot more powerfully soon. And this, again, we have to lay homage to good old uh, Steve Jobs here. Because, again, he was the one who I think really saw it clearer than anyone earlier. And one of the things he did is essentially ensure that every single device had a high, a good, a high quality camera there. And he could see that really what's going to happen now is the next big thing to open up is essentially human-to-human, face-to-face communication. And the reason this is so important is we spent a million years figuring out how to co complex communication, nuanced communication, emotional communication, subtle communication. That's how people communicate. We spent about a million years perfecting that, and we spent about 10 years figuring out how to do it with our thumbs, you know, over, or even texting through email. And so it's opened up a huge category of what we can do as human beings. And so what's happened here, if you look at the, here's a, the last 20 years of traffic on the backbone of the internet here, if you look at the kind of rise and fall of different categories of information, that blue category there is video. And starting in 2005, right around the time of YouTube, it started growing. And by 2010, half of all traffic on the internet was video. And essentially, now what's happening is you've essentially extended out to 2018 here. It is going to be 85% of all traffic on the internet is going to be video. And why is that? Well, one, there's a lot of Netflix stuff going on that you guys are watching. But the, one of the things that's starting to open up is person-to-person -person video. This is Skype's rise. We had half a billion people already Skyping one-to-one -one in 2010. But what's happened in the meantime, starting in 2012 here, we started doing group video. FaceTime got up to four people. Skype got up to 10, was bought by Microsoft. Google once it goes into group video at G+. 
all the big money, follow the money in Silicon Valley, there has been a ton of engineering talent going into this and pulling together what you can do over the backbone of this. And it's, so if you look at that adoption curve, the one-to-one -one Skype era was the early plan around this stuff. This group video is starting to really catch on and people are going, huh, you can do a lot with this. Ultimately, I think this is going to explode here very quickly here. And the reason this is important for innovation and problem solving is essentially all complex work, all strategy meetings, all board meetings, anything that gets seriously done is done by about up to 10 people around a, board, uh, around, a, around a table, looking each other in the eye, negotiating, really having complex communication, and ultimately looking at common documents. And you're starting to virtualize this in a routine and pretty seamless way. So to just give you a break from my talking for one second here, I want to show one video here which kind of gives you a glimpse of what we can actually start seeing in the future here, I think, as we start connecting up people from all over the planet through these video channels. And this is just a, an example of a guy who essentially, um, a composer who composed, had auditions through the internet, had people give their kind of participation into this choir through video, not all integrated at the same time, but he later integrated it, but it points towards, I think, what we're going to be doing very quickly here in the near future. <laughs> Stop it there just to give you a sense though like I want to talk to economics here because technology we, we get it at some level the economics I think is underappreciated and I think one of the things that we got to understand is fundamental economic growth is always driven by fundamentally new technologies and there is that is where things kind of drive prosperity uh, that and one other factor we'll talk about in a second here and we got to just recognize for a minute here folks we are sitting in this supercharged area these are the biggest companies in the world now Apple is the biggest company, Google. These are like, Google's number three in the world. We are sitting on extraordinary wealth that's being piled up here, an extraordinary kind of supercharging of our local economy, which is essentially now starting to take off in the rest of the country here. And so this is something we got to start thinking about. Now, just to kind of remind us how sobering this is and how recent this is, this is essentially the market capitalization of Microsoft and Apple's blue here over the last 20 years. When they started out as nothing in 1990, they were equal. 2000 there, Microsoft in the dot-com boom was, was on a crazy kind of raw, and poor, you know, Apple was barely hanging on there. It was only the long-term vision of, gate, of, of uh, jobs eventually got them to kind of surpass Microsoft as, the most, uh, as a more valuable tech company in 2010. And ultimately, though, now, they have now moved to, they are the most valuable company in the world. I mean, this is literally the market cap of Apple since that 2010 there. Uh, and they are on unbelievable fire. Now, I and mean, there's some stats here. The last quarter is an extraordinary quarter. There's never been a company. This is, this is crazy. There has never been a company that has made as much. Apple earned $18 billion in the fourth quarter in 2014, more than any company in one quarter ever in the history of the world. And are they going to stumble next? You think they're going to slide back? No. In fact, who's not going to get a watch out here, right? This is an extraordinary company, and they've got a lot of running room going here. And they're not the only one. They're just the peak of the crew here. All these Bay Area companies here, this is, again, just take a look at what's going on here with the growth of these companies. The population in the United States is 300 million people. This is essentially the unique users to YouTube, Facebook, and Google, the unique users in a month. This is in 2012, by the way, hitting a billion people. In other words, the bulk of their business is outside the United States. And in fact, this is true of almost any of these tech companies. And so what's happening here is you're watching all these innovative companies, many of them based in the Bay Area here, are essentially the sitting on top of a global pie. It's not a national economy. It's not even an international economy. It is a global economy. So you're watching all these innovative companies sit, are sitting there taking, essentially, the reaping the benefits of a global economy. And so we're getting this extraordinary wealth there. 
And again, as much as you handering about the United States of being kind of falling behind China and stuff, that's just nonsense. You go to any of the, there's nothing comparable to Silicon Valley in the entire world. But there's also, there's nothing like Hollywood, there's nothing like the American military, there's nothing like aerospace, there's nothing like higher ed, there's nothing like healthcare. This is where the innovation happens. That's what America does, does well. Uh, and there's a lot more coming. Now, what's happened, if you look at the income distribution, all this 1% stuff, if this is a century of how much, over the course of a century, what the one, top 1% 1 of the American economy, how much wealth they have amassed out of everybody as a percentage. And we are essentially back at where we were in 1929, before the, 1928, before the crash. And uh, this is one of the things that we're all talking about, the inequality issues. But look at this. This is a really interesting one. That's the tax rate on the upper 1% over the course of the century. And when those tax rates went up in the 50s, up as high as 91%, uh, you watch where the share, the, their share went down. And then you watch where they started to go up. The tax rate essentially has been stable since the early 80s and the kind of Ronald Reagan time. This is going to change, folks. That's one thing for sure. It's going to be one of the re things, the rejiggers that's going to happen in this country. The second thing, though, that's interesting is sidelight. Before there's any kind of tax rate changes, what is happening is a ton of tech money is going into philanthropy. This is the top 50 philanthropists. This just came out, actually, about a week ago. The top 50 philanthropists in the world, last year it was six of them were from the tech industry. This year it doubled to 12. And essentially, those 12 of the top 50 in the world are now have about 50% of all the giving comes from those 12, not the rest of the 50. And look at the names in there. I don't know if you can see this here. Who's after Bill Gates? It's, you probably don't even know this guy. Jay Coleman, that's WhatsApp. Sean Parker from Facebook. The third of this number six is Nicholas Woodman from GoPro. These are the new young entrepreneurs. They're pulling literally half a billion dollars a year they're putting into philanthropy. Again, for us, it's an incredible pool of money that can actually fuel all kinds of things beyond uh, just making money. Now, so the long view of long booms in the economic, this is my first book, which is not the one here. Uh, the first book, is, it talked about long booms. Now, here's the thing about tech and long booms. There are two things that drive long-term economic growth, and this is true if you take that long view of history. This ha always happens. Fundamentally new technologies, and more and more market integration. or It makes it easier to sell and connect things up, and it makes new technologies create whole new markets, or whole new categories of what you can do. If you take that view and look at the great boom of the post-war boom, which everyone hails as the greatest boom, it essentially followed that to a T. You had World War II ended, all these technologies developed in the war went into the private sector, mainframe computers, you know, uh, atomic energy, commercial plastics, all kinds of stuff. And then the second thing is we had half the world, the free world, integrated into, into a really tight, tighter economy. And so in the 1950s, America totally boomed because we love new technologies. We had an open economy. We could take advantage of it. We went crazy. By the 60s, the whole world was essentially, or the whole West was on fire. And it was only in the 70s with the oil shocks, the, the lifeblood of that industrial kind of economy that we essentially shut down about a 30-year run, 35-year run of really robust growth. If you look globally, we have essentially now gone through the exact same thing over the last 40 years here. And how did it work? It's just that we've only had the lens on America. If you look globally, the Cold War ends, and all the technologies developed in the Cold War, computer chips were done for guided missiles. The internet was for communicating a nuclear war. Spy satellites are all now you know, Google Maps, right? It all goes into the, private se or the open public sector. And the second thing is we integrate the entire world, not the free world, but the entire global economy into the same economy. And so what happened? The 90s, America booms. Why? We jump on new technologies. We have an integrated economy, open economy. We take advantage of it. What happened the next decade, the 2000s? The entire world was on fire. China, Brazil, Turkey, you, know, you name it, on fire. We didn't do that well, but globally, it was on fire. And it's only with the financial crash in this decade we're starting to, kind of like the, the stumbling that happened in the oil shocks, that we're kind of thinking, huh, a great long boom essentially is coming to an end. But here's the rub. The next 40 years are just gearing up here. Really, what you're watching here in the Bay Area is the beginnings of the next set of technologies, the next boom. And I would argue it's essentially the boom that's going to basically be around sustainability and climate stop and climate change, clean energy. And so whether you think of it it's just starting to gear up here, but I'm going to strongly argue 
that there will be a wave of these new technologies that you're going to watch the next several decades here that is essentially going to drive another kind of boom that we might actually run out. Again, we don't have the time to go into the details there, but that would be it. So the way, a little simpler way to think about it with that, those, uh, those adoption curves is you had a big integration of all these World War II technologies that lasted about 40 years. We've just are coming to the end of a big integration of all this information, computer and internet technologies, and now we're going to enter the next cycle of new technologies, which bodes well, because if we take climate change seriously, we're going to have to fundamentally change our energy grid, our transportation system, high bandwidth networks to communicate everything. We're going to have to reorganize our footprint in these urban areas. We're going to have to have efficient housing and buildings. We're going to have to sustainable agriculture. We're going to have to adapt to the climate change that's inevitably going to come. It's a huge opportunity to redo everything. That's going to drive a lot of growth. Now, I want to shift here quickly to demographic. And there's a lot of younger people here, but also some older folks here. We're watching essentially a really really promising shift going on in, in our demographics here. And the quick way to understand it is, this is kind of a, a way to understand the population in America right now, is we've got the baby boomers, this huge baby boom, which is now over 50, in their, their 50s and 60s, and they're only got, they're going up the chain here. Uh, and essentially, this is our age pyramid, by the way, but behind them is this millennial generation. Think of them as people 17 to 35 right now. They are bigger than the baby boom, and the baby boom is only gonna get smaller. In fact, it's getting smaller by the day. Uh, and I say this because if you think about that, think about the millennials, and this is just some famous millennials. You start to think, huh, okay, what are those people going to be like driving the next bunch of years? And so if you think, huh, what is this millennial generation? Well, the millennials, you know, quickly, super tech savvy, we know that, very collaborative, very civic-minded. Not only do they like politics, but they're also very high volunteerism, racially diverse more than any other thing, global, and super green. Totally take climate change for granted, right? If you go back to the boomers, of which I'm a tail end boomer, I will say, uh, they were a very different crew. Um, and without getting too into it, uh, you know, they're media savvy, much more individualistic rather than collaborative, indulgent, I'd say, a little idealistic, too principled, because essentially we've got now a situation where the conservatives and the liberals of that generation are essentially paralyzed our government <laughs> because they can't agree on anything and they won't give up either side. So essentially there's some things about the boomers that have been bad for this country. Now if you think about how generations work, this is it. When the big generation like the baby boom was in childhood, they changed the way childhood you know, went. When they came of age in college, they became revolution, you know, they you know, rock music in Vietnam, the whole thing. When they grew up with families, they essentially changed McMansions and you know, all the kind of stuff that went with that stuff. And now with aging, they're gonna totally rechange how retirement goes. But the reason this is important here is think about the millennials' life stage. We're just, wa we watched them go through childhood, which they reinvented at some level. We're now just watching how they are changing how it is to work. They're, they're revitalizing urban centers. They're living in houses of a dozen, 15, 20 people. They want to be together. They don't want to live in the suburbs, you know, with some kind of, you know, McMansion out there. Like, they're midlife. They're not going to raise families out there in the exurbs and stuff. They're going to totally change how that goes. And essentially, they're going to live so long with life, you know, enhancing biotech and genetics, they'll probably have another 20 years of vital life beyond what the boomers would. And so if you look across the century, they are going to drive everything in the next this century. This is going to be the millennial century. And so think of those people applying to all these big changes. Now, in politics too, the second thing about it is they are the most racially diverse, 40% of millennials are from a different um, uh, race. And so here, look out to 2050, we've got a third of Americans are going to be Hispanic, right? So we've watched essentially the integration of the Hispanics in the way we kind of integrated the Irish, Catholic, Jews in the 20th century, right? We've also got this other thing going on here which people have to be aware of, is we've watched the percentage of whites, this is the percentage of the American population uh, for the last 50 years, Whites percent, uh, the minorities going up, white percentage coming down, and this is the American population in 2050 will be essentially, whites will be a minority. That's California right now. That's why we're living the future, and that's why it's gonna affect, what we're doing here is gonna affect America in the next 50 years. Now, I'm gonna shift quickly to the climate politics. How does this all play out on climate politics? Well, one thing is, we are living the future here, folks. We don't have water. 
And I don't know if you saw, even there's just a report that came out today about where it might be entering some kind of mega drought here um, in the entire southwest here. We are essentially going to have to deal with how do you live without water or how do we dramatically less water. Uh, if you just, I mean, basic stuff, but it's just worth reminding, this is a year, this is 2013 snowpack in the Sierra, and that's 2014 snowpack in the Sierra. There's no snow. This was last year. It's happening again this year, right? Uh, it's starting to really crazy thing. Now, what's also happening is we know this is the long-term view, and a lot of the, you are true believers here. We've watched global temperatures from the 1880s when we first started doing it have been inexorably up. But what's happened recently here is the last 15 years, we have hit 14 of the hottest years on record, and last year was the hottest year ever in the history of the world. And the reason I'm saying this is you guys probably know that here, but what's it's finally sinking in. Everybody's starting to get this. A poll just came out last week on climate change and said 78, 74% of all Americans think the government should be doing something right now to actually start dealing with climate change. Of course, we know 91% of Democrats would say that, 78% of independents, but here's the rub. 51% of Republicans say this now. It's now over 50% of the country, of even Republicans, we've hit that tipping point. I'm telling you, this is gonna be like, it's gonna be like gay marriage. It's gonna flip so fast that you'll be an idiot to be the climate denier in a two years here. Just like you ain't seen anybody holding up against uh, this other stuff. Now, if you think of it that way, you think about long ball politics. Everybody in the Bay Area, and I live in Berkeley, and they're always complaining about bombing and all this stuff, all these little things. It's like, if you think in long-term politics, uh, which I think Obama plays, it's been a really interesting analysis of what is his real legacy here. And let me just put it this way. This is almost a concept of rope-a-dope politics. Is he has essentially, Obama has essentially let the Republican, the conservative Republicans go crazy on climate change, denying it, all this kind of stuff, to the point of like any thinking person just thinks this is insane. Why would I want to be hanging out with these folks? He's done the same thing on immigration. He's made them kind of look like ludicrous to a third of the American population to 2015. Yeah, I just showed you the numbers on that. He has essentially alienated all millennials with, you know, the intolerance of gay marriage. He's gotten them to kind of, you know, scream and kick and scream on that one. And ultimately, this thing with his, his war on, the war on women stuff, this, this is what the Republicans have been doing, and he's just been letting them do that. He's, in fact, been baiting them, you know? Send another Keystone Pipeline thing my way. I'm going to veto it, you know? It, it's like, it's, it's rope-a-dope politics. And the reason I say that is because long-ball politics is you want generational politics. You want such big constituencies, all the millennials, all the Hispanics, all kind of the intelligentsia of the country to say, nah, this Republican brand, not into that, and so they're gonna ship. And this is what's happened. It's happened in California. Now, before I get to that, I'll say, what he's also doing now that he's out of the electoral business, he just had this historic climate accord with China. He just went totally f wholehearted for net neutrality, which is awesome. He actually opened up Cuba. He's just swinging for the fences. He's swinging for history right now. He's just, again, he's gonna veto Keystone, it's coming, just watch. Anyhow, give him a chance, think long ball, kind of look at how he's playing a little bit three-dimensional chess in this, that's what I'd say. Now, meanwhile, California has been through the craziness of this paralyzed politics. We had to deal with these kind of like, that whole conservative backlash thing. And so what's amazing now is we're living in the future. We're, this is America, is gonna be in America in the next 10, 20 years here, and in fact, We've got every single statewide official is now a Democrat. We've got a supermajority in the Senate. We've got a supermajority in the State House. We've essentially got 41 of 55 congressional seats are Dems. We've got both U.S. senators, and we've got the U.S. House Majority Leader, right? We can do anything in this. There's like nobody's going to stop us from, and in fact, what's happening? Our governor, Jerry Brown, is already pushing for 50% of, of um, all our electricity has got to be, you know, uh, renewable by 2050. I mean, these are, we're putting in really ambitious goals. There's no backlash against it. They can roll through this stuff. We've got a clear playing field, and that's what we're going to watch happen in the next 10, 20 years. And on top of that, we just had Gavin just threw his heart in the ring for the next four years after him. So you've got another eight years, potentially, of a guy. And Gavin, he totally gets this stuff. Gavin's not going to be like saying, oh, there's no climate change, or let's be cautious. He's going to have a swing for the fences. So we've got a really interesting political opportunity here. And so if you think about the grand politics of climate change, California is going to be that early adopter. We're going to show the world how to do this. We're going to walk, America's going to fast follow eventually with this kind of longer play, delay action of about 10, 20 years, and then you're going to start to see it climb up and flip globally much quicker than people think. Which brings me to my next, and I'm starting to wind down here a little bit, the big idea here 
is if uh, the changes are going to be so profound that we have to start thinking, is this a new civilization that really in any reasonable way has to be thought of as very distinct from what we essentially are rooted on now? And I would argue yes. And I think if you go back to the last time we did this was in the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment essentially was the last time we went through a civilization building. And this is just for, to refresh you guys from history. Uh, it's about 1650 to about 1780s is kind of thought of as the kind of Enlightenment period there. And one of the things that was really remarkable about it is Isaac Newton, for example. Isaac Newton was like the smartest dude of the time, right? He figured out, he invented calculus. Uh, he figured out what, you know, gravity, figured out gravity for the first time ever. And, but here's the key thing. He was the master of the mint of England. England drafted him, the smartest guy at the time, to say, we have to figure out, you have to run the mint. And why do you have to run the mint? Because they were building a civilization. And this is what's interesting. If you go to London, this is kind of a map of London at that time, there were very fundamental things that were being created in the, in the space of about 75 years there. One thing was financial capitalism. They, up until that time, there was no, stable, no currency. There was no reliable currency. The, there was no way, I mean, some people would like, bite off a thing, a, you know, a, a coin, and they'd give it to you, and you couldn't tell if it was really the same coin, whatever. Anyhow, you had to nail a currency, and you, once they did that in England, all the gold of the entire world came <laughs> into London because it was the only reliable place to put money. Anyhow, there was the basic fundamentals of financial capitalism, but also representative democracy. You were coming off these kings thing, and you kind of worked out this deal like, no, 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 we're going to have this representative democracy, a very fundamentally different thing. Then you also looked at a thing, uh, carbon energy. It was the first time we said, ah, we have to scale up energy. Now, it's turned out to be a bad thing now, but essentially, at the time, it was extraordinary, revolutionary, and then they actually came up with industrial production around the early uh, Industrial Revolution. Those are civilization-changing ch things. That's the stuff that really we're still living on now. We're still living in that world. They basically just created there on the long way. This is like 300 years ago, right? 300, 250 years ago. I'm positing that we're going to do that. We're going to be seen like London in that period, San Francisco, starting in the 80s, 90s, up until the 2050s, is going to be seen as that kind of place. And we essentially are going to live, work at that level of fundamental change. We're going to figure out what is a sustainable capitalism. It clearly ain't working now. We have to figure out externalities. We have to figure out all kinds of different things that are different. That won't be not capitalism, but it'll be, I think, a pretty fundamentally different kind of capitalism. We're going to have to figure out a different kind of democracy, because these representative democracies aren't working either. Uh, and there's going to be something now. It'll still be you know, based on it somehow, but you're going to watch some very big changes. A much more participatory will be ways to actually get people's input in ways unfathomable before when they invented representative democracy again 300 years ago. Uh, Renewable energies. We're going to watch the fundamental shift to new energies, and we're going to watch, essentially, instead of industrial production, we're going to watch some kind of waste-free production uh, in a way that's very fundamentally different. Anyhow, I'm just using those as parallels to say, just like they were at that fundamental level, we're going to be working at that fundamental level. And in a more concrete way, all those slides that I was zinging through at the beginning there about what's happening, the seeds of the future, here in San Francisco, it's all going to be happening here. Solar energy, electric transportation, sustainable everything, food revolution, sharing economy, water usage, that's the biggie we're going to have to hit next in the next decade. Uh, you know, is it, are we going to have to have desalination plants? Are we going to, you know, how are we going to do water? How are we going to, you know, how much water are we going to really be able to use for 35 million people on an annual basis when there's no snow in the, in the Sierras? Anyhow, we're going to figure out the balance between AI and humans, robotics, you know, driverless cars. You can study the beginnings of it here. Genetics, you know, how much are we going to genetically engineer food? Because if there's droughts, maybe we have to go with a little more of that. And biotechnology, others. Um, anyhow, we're going to be on our way to, here's the picture of Star Trek's San Francisco. And I put that out there because that's a civilizational thinking. That's essentially the long view, 300 years out. I mean, Star Trek's about 300 years, I think, in the future. Uh, and it's still got the good old Golden Gate Bridge there. I would hope it's been refurbished a couple times, 300 years from now. But the point is, what I'm saying is, think big, think long like that. Now, now that we've thought big, I just want to end here, get winded up here, with one getting a little more concrete. Um, it's, oh, we didn't get the sound there, basically. But anyhow, uh, this is essentially, I want to mention the point that th there is a concrete Manifestation. This isn't all just spaces. This isn't all just swinging our hands around. 
saying, oh, oh this could be done. We're kind of doing my little company, reinventors here in the mission. He, he mentioned this a little bit before about what we're doing. We essentially are taking advantage of this, what I think is a revolutionary transformative platform of interactive group video, and we're applying it to actually starting to solve complex problems. Essentially what we do, just to say that this isn't like, uh, it's, oh, you know, someday we'll do this, is we take essentially innovators, top innovators, and we bring them over this platform, essentially group video. We get them in virtual roundtables working on complex problems. We open this up to larger audiences so it doesn't have to be just them. We essentially edit these pieces into smaller pieces of video that can actually spread out and get these good ideas moving through the web. And we ultimately then put it that way. Now, what we essentially are doing, just to give you a sense of how that works, is essentially we are doing something that a strategy company would do in some ways, bringing smart people together to work on problems, something like a conference is doing, essentially, that is essentially letting people watch these smart people kind of work on complex problems and kind of ask questions and do their thing. And ultimately, it's also like essentially what a, a media studio would do, essentially a studio that would essentially take these great ideas, people staring at the camera, and ultimately uh, getting those ideas expanding out and moving through the web. And so what we have basically done, all that at, by the way, dramatically lower cost. And so what we've done in the last couple of years here is we've brought together this extraordinary number of these crazy innovators. Uh, entrepreneurs, technologists, authors, you know, all kinds of folks. And they all kind of come and they really do love to actually work on solving a lot of these civic level big picture challenges. And they learn from others. We've also had top tier people fund us. This is a sustainable business. There's all these people saying, hey, we will support these kind of roundtables because we need to solve these things like climate change and among other things. And ultimately, We've been doing some, um, some familiar faces here, Michael Pollan and Larry Lessig and Clay Shirky. We've actually done things in these that have led to other things outside these roundtables that actually do get traction in the real world. And so we essentially are reinventors. And you can see us there at uh, reinventors.net. I would encourage anyone to do this. Now, I'm not, uh, I want to just bring us back to the last moment of inspiration here before we get to the Q&A. One second here. Because I think the last time we should return to, we talked about the big picture of reinventing the civilization, but I think what we really got to think back is it's a little more concrete to think about when was the last time we reinvented America and how, could we, how, did, we re, how did they pull that off? Because I think it should be an inspiration to us because this is a doable thing. And so if you go back to the, way, back the time of FDR and others, and you went to their period, they had a financial collapse that was much more severe than ours. They had their set of problems. They had a Great Depression with higher levels of unemployment than we ever had. They had, in fact, the rise of fascism and Hitler that they had to solve. They had the rise of communism. They had nuclear war. The nuclear war was their climate change. They had no idea how to solve it. They were convinced they were going to actually end up with nuclear bombs going off indiscriminately or at least occasionally for the next 50 years. And so they came in, when they first came in, and this is actually a picture of uh, FDR coming in in 32. Um, when they first came in, they had no clue. In fact, they started doing the wrong things. They, they, it was a disaster. And they tried a bunch of stuff, and they didn't know what to do. But you know, all they could really do in the end, and this is all anyone can do, is you can take the technologies that you have at your disposal, and you take the human resources that you have at that time. And in this case, actually, this is Vannevar Bush, FDR's chief science advisor. So you, you get a bunch of old white guys and give them chalk and throw them in a room and say, solve this stuff. Um, in fact, it's worth pointing out, though, that in fact, we didn't have, in fact, we, we didn't utilize half the population. Women were totally underutilized. They were like the typewriter pools, right? Uh, so we didn't even use half the population. Uh, we essentially, yet, we were able to pull off an extraordinary thing in a space of about 15 years. We essentially saved the world economy with the Keynesian economics, a new thing never been tried before. We essentially defeated fascism, both sides of the Atlantic, you know, Atlantic Pacific. We basically contained communism. We stopped nuclear war. To this day, we haven't seen a nuclear bomb go off. An extraordinary feat when you think about it. We essentially then invented whole new, in the space of three years, whole new institutions, the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, all these things that had never, Bretton Woods Accord, coordinating currencies, things that we had never done before. And essentially, we're still running on today. And we did things domestically, like the GI Bill, and you know, the kind of uh, FDIC mortgages, and you name it, all the stuff we know, Social Security. This all happened in the space of 15 years, roughly. And we look back in that era and we say, oh my God, oh, they're extraordinary. How do we ever do that? They're so smart. They're no smarter than us. 
In fact, I think this is the problem. We're in the middle of it now. We are not seeing with clarity what is really happening around us today. But we are every bit as capable. In fact, if you take one metric on human resources, just simple, who has a college education, just as one metric, they had less, just over 5 million people in World War II had a college education. And now, by 2007, it looks like it's, it's about 85 million. We, had, we have 15 times as many college degree people. Not that that's the only metric, but that's, would you rather have 85 million or would you rather have 5 million? It's clear. But the thing that really is crazy is remember what I've been going on from the beginning there. We're going to have, we have essentially, but we're going to have throughout the world, this full bandwidth wireless planetary system. We are going to have handheld supercomputers that are essentially like getting better by the year. We're going to have essentially open channel HD video connecting everybody on the planet through those, H those kind of supercomputers. And we're going to have ways to collaborate that we have never, ever seen before. And just think about it. If you basically went in, just remember, I mean, if you would have gone to FDR and you say, hey, FDR, I got this thing here that you can ask any question in the world and get all the world's information back prioritized in a second. He would have looked at you and said, that's magic. That's insanity. Lock the guy up. But in fact, it's Google. And every five-year-old in the country knows how to do it, right? I mean, the extraordinary power of these te technologies, they're only getting better. So we are completely able to make this transition to this digital all digital society. We are completely able to make this transition to this much more globalized world. We are completely able to make the transition to the clean energy, new energy, and ultimately to create the sustainable world that we actually have been talking about for a long time. And I will argue, in 50, 100, 500 years from now, people will look back in the early part of the 21st century and they'll say, huh, that's when the world went digital, that's when the world went global. That's when the world went sustainable. That's when they essentially laid the foundation for the new age. And they'll say, and that's when San Francisco <laughs> was really the place to be. <laughs> so, uh, that's uh, Anyhow, thank you. Thank you. That is, uh, that's a good point. So make the most of your time here, folks. You're living through an extraordinary moment. Uh, everybody realize what we're going through. And uh, for those of you that can, let's all step up. So anyhow, that is the end of okay. the talk. We pretty much hit the time. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Peter. I'd like to remind our audience listening at home, this is the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Kevin O'Malley. I'm chairman of the Business and Leadership Forum and your host for today. I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator, Tom Burkhart, from the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors, and he will run the Q&A. We'll have a few minutes of questions if you want to line up over here. Uh, there's one gentleman. Please ask your question. Uh, yes, please. Back in, back in 1980, I attended something in Toronto called the First Global Conference on the Future. The dominant impression I came back from that conference was with the power of technology to change values. It seems to me the main value that is being challenged by technology today is privacy. I don't know how many of you have seen Citizen Four. It's an extraordinary documentary. But the power of technology to control all our information gives us, makes us absolutely powerless. Please speak to this for me. Good question. Um, well, here's, here's what I'd say about this. And I don't know if this is going to be a good answer for you. But I will say this. Is I think when you rethink this fundamental rethink of the civilization at some level, or let's just say at the fundamental way that America operates, I think we're going to have to make some really interesting choices. And they won't be, uh, and I think it has to do, the privacy one is a huge one. I just gave you that sense of the data, the amount of data we have now. Essentially, everything we do now is encapsulated in some kind of data. And so we have to think, huh, all right, how much of that is private based on kind of ways we've been doing it for the ever or for the last century or the last post-war world, however you want to measure it. Or how much of it is essentially has to be rethought on what's capable now in a way that never could have been capable possible before and what might be useful going forward. So there's a couple of things you start thinking about with that, which is you go, huh, all right, well, do we want to, what happens if, and I don't, I don't want to scare folks here, but you know, I'm doing a project actually with reinventors right now on reinventing nuclear security, and this problem of nuclear proliferation, for example, is almost worse now than it's ever been. 
And I didn't even think about it. Everyone thought, oh, the end of the Cold War, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, arms control or, 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 or um, nukes. Turns out, actually, there's like 56 suitcase nukes that the Soviets had out of 100 that they don't know where they are. And if a suitcase nuke would go off in essentially San Francisco here, we could lose the whole city, you know, overnight. And so in a world that you could actually kind of super empowered terrorists who you can't counter with, which you could have with the, you know, Soviet Union and China, uh, retaliate, if you, do you, if we're living in that kind of world, how much do you want to know where those people are and be able to lock that down fast to actually solve something of that kind of magnitude? Now, again, I'm just using a kind of extreme version like that because I don't want to make it all about the police state stuff, but it does make you start thinking, okay, do we want to have access in emergencies to actually know people's whereabouts through their cell phones or something? Or anyhow, there's just new issues going forward. And also, there's also positive things. Like now, if you know all these metrics and all this data about you as... What if you could actually have, have AI crawling all your data and figuring out health insights that actually could extend your lifespan by five years or ten years if they actually could point out things that you haven't seen or made the connections to or whatever, and that would require some kind of openness of all the data around you as an individual. I'm just kind of making this up as I go here, but I'm saying this is what I mean by we here in San Francisco in the Bay Area are going to make those decisions. We're going to have to tussle with that. We're not going to just base it on past legacy ideas of privacy. We're not going to just make it as a totally techno fix. It's possible we can actually do it. We're going to make some value decisions in the next 10 to 20 years about what is the right thing to do going forward. What's the right human thing to do to go forward, but also what's the safe thing to go forward. And they're not going to be easy. They're not going to be, they're going to be very hard. And I think we have to stay very open-minded to what they might end up to be. That'd be one. Next question. question. Yeah, Peter. Uh, James Nusa, UIX Global. Uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Very like-minded. And uh, I'm probably going to steal prolifically from a lot of the ideas you presented. Um, there is a UN climate change conference coming up in Paris uh, near the end of the year. Um, I worked with some colleagues here, worked to put together a Bay Area delegation to the uh, Rio Plus 20 Summit in 2012. I'm curious to see what your thinking would be on how to bring the solution portfolio that the Bay Area has to uh, influence and impact that gathering. Uh, there's been some great developments recently with the Chinese and the Indian agreements through Obama, with the Pope engaging the Catholic uh, constituency. But curious to see where you see the, the real levers of impact uh, coming out of the Bay Area and impacting that uh, negotiation. Well, I tell you what, you, you frame a really interesting thing here. It's like. There are, again, if you, I'm a total optimist, and I, you know, I'm incorrigible. For anyone who knows me out there, they, it's like you've seen this over the years. But I will say, you put your fingers on a lot of really interesting things that are happening globally, too. I mean, this accord with China was huge, I think. China is choking, choking to death. I mean, they're children, they can't even let outside because the atmosphere is so bad. I mean, you're finally watching China come really to the table and actually, because of their totalitarian kind of, or their authoritarian government, they can actually make shit happen fast. Um, so you're watching, but that's a big piece. The Pope thing, too, it's starting to really re-channel people's thinking around a lot of things, including climate change. I think, you know, unlike the frustration around Kyoto and the, and the last time we gathered, I think we're starting, this is a different era. And I also think the facts, I showed you a bunch of data on this stuff, I think people's minds are turning, I think the politics are changing the country here, I think this is really, and, and again, remember, we're living on internet time here, folks. I mean, things move really fast. I mean, who would have thought 10 years ago gay marriage would have flipped like that? I mean, who would have thought, you know, smoking, I remember when I first came to San Francisco and, you know, we were the first place to, you know, stop smoking in bars and restaurants and people thought, that's insane, it'll never happen, you know, and now you, you can't go on the planet and find a restaurant that lets you smoke. I mean, these things happen because we're so interconnected, everything moves, once it starts to shift, once it's seen as the thing to do, memes travel, they scale. And I think what's happening if we start spreading this meme, kind of like this talk is kind of doing, this is where it's happening. People are going to, you know, it's not like you have to, like, spend two years and make a trip there and fly. You can just, like, flip on YouTube, and you can watch the Reinventors Roundtables, or you can, you know, whatever. I mean, stuff just connects you immediately into this vibe, and I think this stuff can move fast. I think it can scale, and I think, um, and I think around climate change, you're going to see a lot of that happening. I think we're going to be seen as the place to be. This is why I said we're going to be like London in the Enlightenment. We're going to be like Paris in the 20s, or whatever. I don't know. You can use your examples. It's like if you're going to, I mean, it's already that. I mean, this is like the millennial mecca. I mean, this is like everybody is coming here. All the entrepreneurs are coming here. I mean, where else are you going to go right now for where it's happening? 
It's in, the smart people figured it out, but ultimately the rest of the world will too. And I think that's a good thing. I don't want to be gloating about that or be, have any hubris around that, but I'm just saying, let's just recognize it. We're living in this crazy moment here in an amazing place, and uh, we just got to get the word out even uh, faster than it is now. So anyhow, that would be a quick turn on that. Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Oh, there's a guy. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk today. Um, like most of us here and the last commenter, I find myself uh, uh, amazed with uh, the commonalities that we share in uh, philosophy and what we're realizing about the upcoming changes um, in the world. Uh, my question is, if you have uh, a, an idea, a social reform idea that involves the use of technology, what would be your advice to someone who has little technological background but wants to pursue applications that uh, can really reshape social interaction? Yeah, that you make a really good point here. Um, one thing I really want to be clear about, even though I'm kind of rooted in technology and speak a lot about technology and usually communicate I overemphasize tech a little bit here just because it's the driving force of a lot of stuff. I want to be super clear, though. What the changes that have to come from now on about changing how America works, reinventing America, or civilization building on a level, that is not about tech. That's about understanding the power of tech, understanding the capability of tech. But the hard work of civilization building, if you want to get down to it, system changing, is done by not techies. It's done by all the rest of us. And so I think there's room for, tons of room for non-technologically savvy folks to actually be rolling up their sleeves and solve this. There's people in this room I know here too. I mean, for example, the whole food revolution. How are we going to sustainably do food? I mean, food doesn't have to be, it's not, it, there is an element of tech that actually could impact that, but there's a whole new rethink at a fundamental level about that. There's a whole sharing economy stuff. It's kind of tech enables it, but it's all about how do human beings share things? Where do we do boundaries? What's the laws? What are the, how does insurance work and that stuff? I mean, all these kind of ways that you system build. So when I talk about reinvention, I don't talk about it primarily as the design and building of the actual technology. I think of it as redesigning, restructuring, reinventing the systems around those technologies to actually do the things that affect everybody's lives. And that's what we're doing now in society, in education, in politics, in government. It's all starting to move now. When I first came to Wired, it was all about the technology 20 years ago. Even 10 years ago, you could say it was still a big tech story. We're now out of the tech phase. It is now a phase of the system building. And that's where we all have a role for that. And I encourage you all to, to play a part. Peter, uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel great. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. All right, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, folks.